Hi, and welcome to this first part, should we say, on this long session on learning from disasters. Um, this is looking at accident theories is the first part, but ultimately what I'm trying to do is link it to uh, the further development, should we say, of how, how this impacts. So the aim of the a module in general is to look at what we can learn from disasters, but more significantly, I want to look at the link between accidents and I think are determined as uh, disasters. But think about safety and engineering, think about reliability, think about uh, maintenance. But in order to do that, we need to appreciate culture and, and also the links with accident causation, should we say first. So this particular part is focusing on accident causation. And then the next one that you'll get will focus on some of the uh, HAZOPS, fault tree analysis and FMEA approaches and then going on to maintenance, the importance of maintenance and how it can make a difference in terms of safety critical issues. So we're going to focus initially on accidents and uh, I want you to appreciate the differences between the causation models around accidents and the different people that are involved and the research that they've done and they I guess arguably some of the, the theories that they have that, that are quite different in different parts. So Dan Peason, first of all, rejected the notion of accidents being the result of a single event coming about in a specific situation. He argued that accidents might be the result of a combination of a number of causes. Um, there was nothing wrong with that. And if you think about other theories like domino theory, what he's done is develop that, um, but in a more practical way. And, and taking away the not just focusing on unsafe acts and unsafe conditions, trying to think broader around that. Um, and therefore, the domino theory is good in itself, but he did point out some of the failings of it. Um, and if you focus on cause alone, then does it really give you the answers that you'd be perhaps looking for and in terms of prevention later on? And um, I guess it's like the ink block theory, you know, if you only put a little bit of ink on, on blotting paper, it might only spread a small amount. But uh, the little branches that come off, maybe they identify the, the causes as such. But the more ink you put on, or the bigger the splash, and perhaps the wider the branches or the longer the branches, therefore you can investigate further and start to look at things called sub-causes. And that's, that's part of what we're saying is rather than looking at the immediate cause, look at the sub-cause and then link it to root cause analysis as is a common practice. But again, what I want to focus on is that link between root causes and the knowledge and the learning of it that will help prevent disasters. So that's the idea is in terms of let's start off by looking at multi-causality and behind every accident there lies many contributory factors. And uh, in some of the theories you'll see from this, the focus perhaps is, is the culture of the organisation and the management uh, in this latent kind of way of doing things rather than a proactive way that have led towards disasters and, and accidents in particular. So um, his multi-causality model looked at the, whatever went wrong at the top of the tree, should we say, but focused on three key areas. Um, and obviously there's some element of the human factor built into that. But then you look at the poor design of the machinery, the ergonomics kind of aspect to it, and then the management side, and one, one of which can be lack of training, but it can be more than just that. But this is just an example of what we mean by multi-causality. And interestingly, this changed my way of doing accident investigations uh, in the workplace because I was focused too much on unsafe acts and unsafe conditions. But you've got to, and I, I will explore it later, but we've got to look at every time there's an accident, where was the management failing? Don't specifically just look at that as the main cause, but change your thought process, say the latent aspect perhaps has led towards this because we've not invested enough time, effort and resources as a preventative measure. And when you use that, then obviously there's a big thing, a, a consideration, should we say, between uh, what, what we want and what we expect uh, to prevent disasters. So here, Peterson's saying that, we tended to become confused over the years, you know, too much focus on these unsafe acts and unsafe conditions. And the things that allowed the acts or produced the conditions 
we've forgotten or not even thought about. So think about those sub causes because it could be, you know, culture is the way we do things around here. Well, is the culture the right type of culture? Are people and management uh, taking responsibility and managing health and safety effectively? So within this, Peterson looked at the symptoms. Um, and again, you look at it from a different perspective, you know, all those little bits and pieces that could lead towards this overall uh, cause of, of, of root analysis. So achieve uh, permanent improvements. We need to look at those root causes. And just like the Herald of, Herald of Free Enterprise, if we look at a couple of other models, you'll see where Peterson's coming from here in terms of the limitations. So let's use Herald of Free Enterprise. If we use the domino model, uh, the assistant Bolson was tired on a long shift. So it focuses on him being at fault, the person. So the assistant fell asleep, fell asleep. Uh, and therefore the unsafe act or condition was that person uh, not doing the job properly. They didn't uh, comply and they didn't, in this case, close the bow doors. And that resulted in the incident. Okay, so there's that aspect, you could say, that Domino focused on the people issue. <clears throat> um, Bird and Loftus expand it slightly more because now it's more focused on management and, and supervision. You, you could argue that there wasn't enough control and therefore the basic cause, causes should have been looked at. And uh, the fact that the bosun was tired um, because of working the long hours, who's allowed that to take place? supervision and management you know they've not analyzed it and they've, they've allowed bad practices and bad behaviors to develop so there's an element of that and therefore the immediate cause was the bow doors the bow doors not uh, being closed as they should have been done before setting sail however because the assistant boss didn't do their job you could argue that the unsafe act and condition was focused on the bow doors being left open now doesn't say anything like uh, why does the captain or why does somebody else on the ship not make sure that the bow doors are closed before uh, it sails away? And interestingly, it doesn't look at the fact that this has become a habit whereby the, uh, the captain uh, allows this because it gets them going a little bit quicker into the sea uh, because they're against the tide. So they want to get this done as quickly and efficiently as possible. So apparently that had been allowed to happen for quite some time. Um, uh, maybe if the, the assistant bosun had pressed that button and the doors had showed closed sooner, then perhaps the disaster wouldn't have happened. But nevertheless, um, there's that aspect of responsibility. And from multi-causality, it will explore this area more to say, why did you allow the bad practice to develop? So Burden Loftus was, was better some ways than domino theory, but even that has its limitations. So the multi-causality approach will look in further depth around that um, and focus on the symptoms that affected the cause, which ultimately means root cause analysis. So the most basic cause that can reasonably be identified and that management should focus on and indeed fix. Um, so try to be as basic as you can when you uh, root cause and go down the, the list of uh, specific reasons. And when doing that, specify it as to why an incident has occurred that enabled recommendations to be made. The point I'm saying that doesn't really help in terms of prevention. What you're using is historical evidence, things that have happened from disasters that then we say, well, now that we know that, perhaps we can use it to prevent something from happening again. But interestingly, safety practitioners and uh, certainly management teams perhaps don't focus enough on those areas typically in medium to low risk environments. However, there's a, a different culture in, in some industries because they don't tend to have those uh, major accents as much. And uh, perhaps there's a good reason behind that. So I'll explore that further later. But nevertheless, we can learn from the past, uh, but it requires the, the, the group of people involved in analyzing this to be aware of that and then to apply it in an open fashion so that then the, it's knocked on the head. It, do, it doesn't become a root cause because it's analysed just like you were done in, in a fault tree or an FMEA because it's looked at before it becomes a major hazard and it's put right because the systems, the procedures, the way of working prevents that rather than relying on the, the human factor. 
So fault tree analysis is one of the examples that we use for this. And as you know from the previous sessions, uh, the purpose of fault tree analysis to break it down and to alter all of these logical uh, approaches and look at what could go wrong and then work from that a visual representation of the relationship between the causes that led up to the accident. You don't always have to wait for an accident. What I'm saying is designers, managers and teams of people, projects, for example, need to work on this in a proactive way to say what could go wrong rather than waiting for it to have happened and then analyze it retrospectively. And that's the idea. You know, you've, you've got your gates and your fault tree analysis and the logical structure of the branches that work towards the mishap or things that could potentially go wrong. I mean, the idea behind the management is to make sure that they say, let's avoid this. And the same thing is, is fairly in mold effects analysis. They do exactly the same thing, but they do it in a, in a linear fashion. They use different components. And they say that if a series of things happen in that particular way, then it results in uh, the disaster. So where you've got an AND gate, perhaps for failure mode effect analysis focuses on AND gates a lot rather than OR gates where there's variations on a theme. But nevertheless, ultimately, it's an analysis system that gets you to look at what potentially can go wrong. And, and there, they, they might use the logic approach and they might have the symbols in place to support the interpretation of each type of event. Fine, you know, I'm not going to talk about that today, but at least the important thing is to work through each stage of any particular incident that might happen. And that, that word there of intersection, you know, um, if you look at the a collision example at an intersection, so, um, you know, a junction in, in terms of traffic, every time a vehicle approaches a potential junction point intersection, um, what are the chances of collision? So if you break that down, you can look at the variations on a theme that can impact on the vehicle, the car or whatever, whatever it may be that's coming towards a junction. And then the other vehicles uh, that are on the main section, should we say. So how do they interact? What can go wrong? And so on. So this is just one example of the potential associated with use of FTA. Uh, and in this case, you can see how the human element comes into it, as well as road conditions and other signs and symptoms and signals that can all come together. Um, and the one thing I want you to look at right at the bottom on the left hand side is that AND gate. And we're looking specifically there at vehicle brakes. But in our world, what I'm saying is things mechanically can, that can go wrong, things in the uh, process that can go wrong. Because when we look at that, we, we have an element of reliability that we expect of machinery and equipment. And therefore, that reliability plays a significant part. And just like, as I was saying in the next session, we'll be talking about provision use of work equipment regulations and the need to provide something that's fit for purpose. The next bit is to then, once you've provided it and you think it's fit for purpose, it then needs to maintain. So it stays in that state and you'll have that element of reliability. So causal analysis is used uh, at design stage and it also thinks about the life cycle of certain component parts and different pieces of equipment in different environments to then say well corrosion we're, we're right next to the sea or this particular pipe uh, is is inside the water that's salt water corrosion typically will come about in x amount of time let's say uh, 12 months and therefore the maintenance engineer would program it in to say every 12 months we need to replace that pipe you know those kind of factors are thought at design stage and then becomes part of the process throughout and hence that's what we're meaning by the link between accident causation and then analyzing what can go wrong so that we can learn from it and predict and then put in place adequate reliability checks um, the downside on, on, on FTAs is the, is the people involved in it and the limitation, perhaps, of their knowledge or the time and effort they put into it. Um, so some would argue that if you have a decent group with lots of competent people with different backgrounds involved in the discussion, you couldn't have a real good FTA. But that's not always the case. Sometimes people trip themselves up and, and think about dynamics within groups of people. Um, when they're arguing, 
um, and debating strongly about how, how something should be done. Perhaps the, the loudest shouter gets heard longer and therefore they dominate some of the discussion when perhaps they're not the specialist who can really analyze the particular problems in it. So there's that aspect around knowledge associated with the work activity and process. There's the logic aspect that requires the success of fella to be thought through. Um, but again, it's possible to misinterpret it. So think about that. And, and then what about the humans involved? They might be tired. They might have been under stress for a longer period of time whilst considering this. And then they get to the phase where they just accept without... Um, arguing or debating it significantly to offer the resources. And then if you put back to the idea I said before, if a manager is not prepared to pay for it or put the resources in place, then perhaps that also contributes to the potential. So it, it does identify causal factors, which is great, but it doesn't suggest corrective actions. And that again is a limitation on this particular field. It comes down to people talking about it and saying, what, what now should we do and, and how can we do it best? Um, and also when you look at root cause analysis as well, as well as FTAs, uh, the depth of that analysis is arbitrary and it's a function associated with that time, money and resources invested. So going back to the point I said previously about how much do you do and what's considered significant and effective. And that's why I mentioned earlier the ink block. You know, if there's, uh, if there's only a small ink block that's going to put out a few of the stems, um, you might analyze it uh, in a simplistic way, but the larger the ink blot, the more the stems, potentially, the more discussion that's needed, the more time, effort, and resources to put something right. So that's one of the starts. Uh, Olnagel uh, in 2004 has developed some of these theories. And what the idea is in the earlier days, unsafe acts and unsafe conditions was a key issue. Now we've started to consider the human element in a bigger and wider fan. Uh, so uh, as you know from the previous module where we talk about human factors, there's a heck of a lot involved in that. And here, uh, Olnagel uh, focuses on human performance. And we perhaps I'm thinking uh, about that before. If in, uh, I would, I'm, 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 I'm just uh, stretching the, my interpretation of it here, but let's say the time a motion person was still around, they were probably effective up until the mid 70s, 1975-ish, I would say. And then after that, you seem not to see as many of these time and motion people around. And their, their um, role was to look at the way a job was done, to look how efficient that was being done, and then put a time against it. And then perhaps having learned from different people's interpretations of how that work is done, uh, sharing a best practice, some would argue, the, to then say, well, we can cut that time down and therefore become more efficient. Others would argue that that trips people up in some ways because um, sometimes you need rest periods in between doing, doing things. So it was using manufacturing a heck of a lot. And um, you can see, just as, as I'm saying there, around that period where you've got the technology of equipment developing to you know, go, I'm, I'm going way back here. There's much more developments. But if you think about the Industrial Revolution and how we become more and more reliant on systems and procedures that support technology and the development of technology, it's it's helped us in many ways and it's made the job easier. And certainly ergonomically, it's, it's improved things. But it also goes focused through the early 60s all the way through to the mid 90s, I would say, around um, total quality management. And then I developed into Kaizen and make Six Sigma and, and variations on that. All of those looked at management techniques and the way we do a particular process and how we can improve performance around that. So the East Holnagel's come from that background and then said, how, how can we improve upon this? And he has this systems thinking approach. So it's more of a conceptual way of analyzing the organization and in particular problem solving again that's become a trend because in tqm total quality management it was identify a problem find a solution you know and you use that technique quite often uh, but consultation and engagement played a big part in making total quality um, successful so that engagement involved teams 
and the people got together to say that's the problem this is the potential solution that best works for us in our cell or in our environment and therefore we should invest in that so that system thinking is useful for tackling those issues and it embeds that complexity as such it simplifies it a little bit but when you've got a more complex piece of equipment then the more time and effort's required to understand it and apply it properly so particularly when it involves human activity because then you've got the potential for it to to go wrong somewhat so that led them from the systems theory to then the reductionist thinking so how can we use the information around the solving the problem to then break it down into, into its individual elements in a systematic way, but then looking at reduce the impact, reduce the potential. Yeah, so that idea. So it is uh, reducing the complexity to a simple, simplified way. But at the same time, it relies on that group of people that are working on that problem solving to come up with all the components. And, and again, uh, human nature is sometimes they'll miss those components. So systems thinking as an alternative strategy for simplifying complexity, namely going up a level of abstraction, higher levels of abstraction, loose detail, and it's, it's the loss of detail that provided the simplification. Um, some would argue you can oversimplify sometimes and therefore that results in it, in, in it being weakened, but nevertheless it is bring it down to its simplest format and look at that as a root cause or potential for things going wrong and then look at ways of eliminating or reducing that or controlling that risk adequately. So thus, when people talk about the behavior of organizations, they're eliminating the rich detail of how individuals or groups within the organization function. Yeah, so they're not interested in the roles, not inter interested in the culture. They just say, in order for this to work, this is the simplest understanding of how this happens. We now need the right strategy and approach to make it happen. So the importance there is just to focus on it. Uh, in its simplest form. But the interaction or the internet connection of the components is largely maintained in the process of abstraction. And that's when detail can get lost. So you've got to be get the right balance, should we say, in, in that restriction or reduction of the potential. And it's interesting, I guess, from an analogy point of view, to think about two uh, variations on a theme. So if you look at a rock, a linear movement, you know, through gravity, if you throw a rock, it's going to go in a particular line. And then you look at a live bird where the, the, the movements, the air currents, the thought process of what the bird wants to do as such are very different. So it's, it's two ways of looking at it. So if you look at it from a, a mechanical linear model and you do it step by step in a logical way, that is excellent in many ways of understanding where you're going to start and where you're going to finish. So that's good, you know, but it has its limitations. It's useless for predicting things like the variables, uh, the trajectory of a bird in this case. Um, and although they're both subject to the laws of physics, they have a different way of going from A to B. And therefore, it's those variables we need to take account of in our workplaces, because not everybody's going to go the rock route. Some will go in different ways. And that's that's the idea around, behind that philosophy there. Therefore, we've got to look at the conceptual framework for managing safety. And within that, you think about the people bit and where that can vary. And then you look at the job itself, uh, which can quite often be very linear. So you put the systems and procedures in place and the equipment that makes you go down a logical linear route. But the variables are the people themselves. So when we introduce these reductionist theories, um, we've got to not oversimplify and at the same time not over complex it, these issues. You know, it's got to have that right balance. Uh, but this does not help us to understand the interconnections and the interfaces of the components in any organization, because all organizations are slightly different. And therefore, whether you say that's the culture or otherwise, that variation does have an impact. So, you know, just using that picture, you can see how you can break things down from one example of uh, in an airport, how, how things are performed and moved around and activities associated with a potential fire. Uh, and a potential something going wrong, like a crash in of an airplane, um, you can look at what might happen and then what existing resources you have, what procedures and systems are in place, 
uh, but does it cover the variables adequately in terms of people performance? And, and when we do consider this, what monitoring and what data do we have in place to manage those variables? So that's the idea behind the reductionist theory. So in contrast, there's this systems thinking. Um, so that looks at the whole picture, the environment in which the systems interact, the subsystems, their operation and the interaction involved in, in, in that. You know, it kind of breaks it down in, in specific areas so that all the questions have to be answered. And that's why we have a system theory approach. Um, that, however, can be complex. Um, failures are never due to a single cause. And that's one of the big things about this theory. So by taking this kind of the view of the failure and its settings, the layers of the causes of the failure become clearer and more ordered in the mind. So this has been proved. If you look at Kegworth, if you look at Herald Free Enterprise, if you look at Clapham Junction, there were some system issues, there were some people issues, there were some more complex root causes, and certainly the management style and also the lack of resources all led to the, the misinterpretation. We've also got the people themselves in, in, in a variety of different situations and how they acted in an emergency. Um, so from a performance perspective, can you rely on your uh, fire wardens, for example, can you write on your emergency team and your emergency response to get there quickly and effectively and automatically put on all everything that they need to do to make themselves safe and avoid um, major incident. So there's that aspect around this causation. So the accident causation thinking theory around systems was describe explain and predict the behavior of complex organization systems. Now that it becomes um, headache in some ways. Some companies really struggle with that bit because they have to look at themselves and say, how good are we at this point in time in handling any situation? Not just from a, uh, a disaster point of view, but from a prevention point of view, the way we work. Um, and then look at the engineering of it. How reliable is it? Um, what, are, what are the safety critical issues? If something goes wrong, are we adequately prepared? If there is something that can go wrong with the equipment, how often are we maintaining it to make sure that that longevity is increased or the potential is decreased? So there's all those aspects around the problem approach to find the most effective solution in that way and quite often it can be uh, a combination of technical issues so you need a group of people that can look at the technical aspects but also you need an, an element around the human focus uh, on the social aspects associated with interfaces you know did like um i think they called it the ains 57 but when the investigation was done by the the japanese waste issue at um, nuclear fuels and when they looked at that, they said that there was 57 different ways of interpreting a safe system work, because when they interviewed and analysed um, all the operatives working at the nuclear fuels, they said, oh, well, I know I'm supposed to follow that system, but I found a different way of doing it. And or it was overly complex and they didn't understand it. Or they had a group of people that were have a different background and didn't understand it. And then they just find their way through. And, and that is, from a social aspect, that's a major potential problem. So then it leads us to Turner's work, um, e-search for common pre preconditions in organisations. Yeah, so again, the culture, how they work. And he identified a set of preconditions which argued were organisational and underlying in many areas. And he, he started off by doing you know, offshore work, maritime work, and then he also then expanded the research to to cover mainland issues as well um so if you think about that from offshore work and, and working in working maritime the potential for a disaster has been proved in many cases and the aspects around the type and nature of work meant that it was high risk so perhaps the attitude towards some um, of these risks was was good and, and quite safe you could argue, however, that latency has, has developed and some management weren't doing what they should have done. And as a result of that, it was a causation factor. So 
He says that it, it established the concept of an accident waiting to happen being an ill-defined problem. So again, if you go back to the theories we said earlier, problem and solution, um, it means that it comes down to the technical ability of the people involved in that project to be able to come up with the right answers and then look at reliability. Um, and then when we look at reliability and performance of people and performance of equipment and performance of systems, all that combines to then say where the true problem may lie. So it's a much wider way of looking at this. Other features from Turner were, um, were they rigid, should we say, in the perception and beliefs within the organization? Um, so inflexibility, you could argue, as well as flexibility because of culture and attitude. Um, there may be lots of little decoy problems that get in the way that don't truly identify the key, the key problem. Now, sometimes that's uh, a management technique, you know, that a manager will often say no to anything put forward because it means less work for them. Um, and therefore that latent approach can lead to major, major issues because the people who come in with the questions, if they know they're going to get a no answer, eventually they're going to stop coming and therefore you get problems. So decoys can come in place quite often with management styles. Every organization, I guess, is exclusive, but that exclusivity means that they can use it to their defense quite often and say, yeah, I know that industry practice says do it this way, but that doesn't adapt to us because we're different to that organization or we're quite different in our industry to anybody else. It's quite often used as an excuse. There is the aspect of complexity leading to information uh, not being detailed enough and therefore you get difficulties, particularly in like I was saying with the Heinz 57, where it might be misinterpreted information as well. Um, involvement of strangers, especially on complex sites, you know, um, contractors, visitors, and the like, so were one of the key areas there, but also uh, new starters. And uh, how long will it take for them to get fully competent in their job role to be able to do it effectively and efficiently? So there's, there's those aspects as well as around when we bring some, someone new into the area or someone who's strange to the area as much as the amount of knowledge and skills that are great, it's the lack of experience on that side in that particular work area that can lead to problems. Uh, failing to comply with existing regulations, you know, so compliance in general, it comes down to perhaps interpretation of what compliance is, because quite often the, the regulations and legislation the way it's worded comes down to the interpretation of the, the manager or the safety person or others collectively before that decision is made. So it could be that they've, uh, or they just, they just don't put enough into it. So, and they're not prepared to be a, a, a kind of like a, a village uh, or cottage industry approach to health and safety management. They don't want to put health and safety first and, and therefore they, they struggle through things. Uh, the in minimizing emergent dangers is trying to like put it off a little bit and not, not turn everything into a crisis. And, uh, and therefore playing things down can quite often lead to, um, you know, you're, you're into the crisis and you're too far into it before you've taken action. And therefore it's a bigger uh, chance and opportunity to, to expand and make things go wrong. Um, features from uh, this area have effect and therefore this incubation stage, again, that latency and the time involved in the people can ultimately lead to the disaster expanding. So it accumulates unnoticed if we don't address it. So the idea that Turner has is look at these features and predict and then change the management team theories and change their culture, change the way they do things. So it's, it's not uh, a major concern and it's managed effectively. And there's been some similarities, again, learning from disasters that we find out that um, there are things, trends, I'll call them, that have happened in all of these disasters that we can learn from. Therefore, use that in hindsight and predict and prevent. That's the idea. So all accidents occurred with complex systems which have made considerable efforts and devices for defences in depth. And I'm going to talk about defences in, in more detail. Each accident arose from an adverse conjunction of human failures. It's always human failures. Um, and it's not just the individual uh, and pointing the finger at the individual that caused the accident, incident or disaster. It's about the group of people that were behind them. 
uh, that led to that situation. So the most significant of which were committed long before the accent sequence was apparent. So you can now see the link between culture and the lack of supervision, should we say, and the lack of strength in management that have allowed uh, bad practices to come in without being challenged. So organizational accidents, the following model is described by reason. So we're taking a stage further here and uh, some good stuff in, inside this, but it comes back to that multi causality approach. Um, and idea being that there's many people involved. There's many people operating at different levels of their respective companies. And therefore, each and every one of them has the potential to increase the risk of an incident. Um, Typically, they are a product of recent times of, and of technological innovations. So if you think about how people have to change to the way of working, and as a result of that, as technology advances, it changes your attitude, your beliefs, and the way that you work. So um, classic one is if we try to reduce manual handling in the workplace, so we bring in mechanical handling equipment, um, there's how it's a more complex risk there's more potential for things to go wrong at a higher level so rather than somebody having a bad back from carrying heavy loads you know have the potential for a faultless truck to run over or or crush and uh, impact someone whilst they're driving it around so those kind of things you know as technology advances um, and changes things it, it will have impacts on the people and the way that they work um, and a classic one for me having experienced in, in manufacturing and warehousing for quite a few years, um, was the driver on the fault of truck, for example, would speed around if they were allowed to, get the job done as quick as they can so they can have a longer break. Um, so perhaps they'll do what typically should take an hour, they'll try and squeeze it into 40 minutes, and then they've got 20 minutes to then relax and take it easy. So there's those attitudes as such, rather than driving around at a safe speed, or even changing the equipment so they can't drive fast, you know, putting regulators on them, et cetera. So there's, there's that aspect around um, this theory. Um, whilst they may be truly accidental in the way various contributing factors combine and come together, to cause a bad outcome, there is nothing accidental about the existence of the precursors, nor the conditions which create them. Yeah. It's all come together to cause that one accident or one disaster. And it's usually latent effects that have developed over months and in some cases years uh, that have led towards that particular incident. The more complex the organization, the more chance, simple as that, you know, the more complex the equipment, the more chance for things to go wrong. And so, yeah, so multitude of defenses are needed when you put complex systems and complex organizations in place to manage uh, the effects of potential disasters. All organizational accidents entail the breaching of the barriers and the safeguards. So any control measure you put in place to minimize risk, yeah? So they breach that and that separate damaging and injurious hazardous, hazards from vulnerable people and assets. Yeah, now, now we're looking at loss management and loss risk management, should we say. If you think about it from that perspective, there's a different philosophy there in, in managing loss than there is around managing safety and managing risk. Such a very, very different approach. And that's what this is trying to do in the organizational access, bring both of those theories together. Uh, a loss adjuster, for example, will anticipate that after the event, will say what the causal reasons were for that particular fire explosion that the insurance company has to pay out for. And, and in some cases, they'll try and go down and, and deep on the root cause to tell where the, the employer, the management team went wrong. And from their perspective, they're trying to mitigate the amount of money that the insurance company has to pay out because they say, well, in accordance with our clauses in our insurance for employees liability and public liability, et cetera, you have not followed. So what they're saying is risk is managed from a different perspective. Um, so that's what I'm saying here, that, that breach uh, as such is they'll look for ideas around why those control measures were not effective. And then they'll point finger where that's, that's not what health and safety risk management is about. It's more about prevention and putting it right before it becomes a major incident. 
But the key point I want you to look at there is the vulnerable people and the vulnerable assets. Yeah, if we risk manage it effectively, then ultimately um, these things shouldn't happen. So if I've got a big, large racking system in a warehouse and I've got four of trucks driving around, at the base of it, I'll make sure that I'm doing regular checks on my racking system to see if there's any damage. Maybe even from a prevention measure, I put impact resistant systems in front of the racking system so that the forklift truck can't hit the racking and, and de destabilize it. Uh, and also I'd supervise and watch the way in which uh, people are driving the forklift trucks around or other means of lifting equipment and making sure that those habits, bad uh, habits in particular, don't get to the extent where they become problematic. So we can supervise, we can enforce and change behaviours. So I mentioned before about defences. This is a great way of looking at it to prevent. Yeah, so if we keep, if you think about, you'll see the, the, the cheese model later and then the linear aspect of if everything lines up, that it, it led to the incident, accident or disaster. With these defences, we're trying to stop those variables from lining up so that the arrow can't go through. So this is the idea around, um, again, some would argue that it's, it's typical mitigation approaches. So there's that understanding of the local hazards and people being fully aware of it, and then training, instruction and supervision around that. Clear guidance on how operate safely so that it avoids uh, the crisis situation. Um, alarms and warnings that are always in place and they're always functionally effective and everybody knows what they do in the situation when an alarm goes off. And also that issue around imminent, you know, danger is imminent. That's the warning should be, uh, how do we respond to it? So my example is why, why when a fire alarm goes off um, in a university, do the African students carry on work in the library when everybody else has got out? It, it was a cultural thing. And they, when I talk to them about it, they just say, oh, we just, we just see an alarm as a, a distraction. Uh, um, what we do is we switch off to it. So there's the aspect about what does the alarm actually mean and then what action is required but also from an imminent danger point of view the timeliness of the response and the effectiveness of the response to prevent the crisis from escalating uh, and again as we're saying there restoring the safety so look at the state of the situation at the time and normalizing it bringing it back to a safe condition so again effective response in a timely manner. So those defences and mitigation factors help to prevent disasters, um, to inter interpose safety barriers between the hazards and the potential losses, mitigation factors. You know, the more safety barriers you put in place, the less potential for loss. Um, contain and eliminate the hazards where you can, so typical risk management approach. Um, provide means of escape, so think about when it does go wrong, then what can they do? What's the emergency response? And what's the uh, expected route? And so on. Signs, uh, symptoms, signals, and uh, finding the means of escape and then getting out. But also on the rescue side, what if uh, someone's unconscious in the middle of the area? They've got, let's say, they're overcome by a noxious substance. Um, do you have one of those safety hubs that you put on? And you put the safety on, and now you're breathing clean air. And you've got 10 minutes with the safety hold on to be able to perhaps rescue that person who's suffering. Similarly, if you think of offshore, they've taken it even further because they think, well, if the, if the rig is in the North Sea, we've got the issue of if they're 20 minutes inside the sea itself, they could die of hypothermia. So what have we got from a rescue point of view? So there's the helicopter training they do, the, the water training they do, the... Um, the need to put on the right gear, and then when you've got the gear, how it's used to perhaps save your life. So it's that multiplicity approach. You know, if we look at it from a perspective, the more laps we have in place, the more mitigating circumstance, the more defences we have in place, the less chance of that arrow to go through. Um, but that in itself can be quite complex and it relies on the technological systems to be in place to prevent that uh, and therefore you need competence of people involved largely proof against single failures 
So it comes back to that idea before us. Don't just focus on the obvious. Think about the human element and where things can go wrong. If from a reliability point of view, let's say uh, maintenance engineers have not done their service checks on the kit for a long period of time. And even though the alarm might work, think of Bunsfield, uh, it got into a bad practice there where the, uh, the safety critical element was ignored as such and people didn't know how to put it in safety state and they didn't know that it wasn't performing as it should have done so all of those bits and pieces come together to create that failure so don't focus on one single failure single failure look at the overall tech technical and human aspects that pull together together so consequently in these types of organizations there are very few individual accidents it's usually a combination of several factors that have led to it. So defences in depth, uh, largely achieved through a mix of hard and soft applications. So you might have the systems and procedures in place, but all the, over and above that, you've got the hardware, the wiring, the equipment, the, the right materials and so on and so forth. Um, they do have a mixed blessing. You know, it does develop in some companies, it develops a positive forward thinking safety culture. In others, it's um, a downward trend and they don't want to do this. And so it, it does have falls and against as, as any approach will. Um, on the downside, they make systems more complex and more opaque. So it can be mis misconstrued, misunderstood uh, or not applied in line with the way intended. And uh, therefore, it can create holes in the defense. So when we do have holes in the defense, and we always do, in reality, each layer has its weaknesses and each layer has its gaps. And therefore, the, the arrow going through has more chance of it to make, make its target. Um, it would be great if they were static, if they're all fixed, because then you could then look at it from a linear perspective, that rock dropping due to gravity, rather than the variables of a bird flying around so for that reason we say it's not flux and it's harder to then uh, manage therefore the holes in the defenses are shifting around and because of that there are times when it will line up so we then have to link it to the latent failures and also the active failures um, and pull them together. So typically in its simplistic form, if we look at active failures, it's unsafe acts and unsafe conditions. That's what we tend to look at as such. But now we're saying that the latent conditions, yeah, look into more detail. As much as the active failures are people, errors and violations, the latent conditions are allowing those situations to develop. And these are known as resident pathogens. Yeah, so those resident pathogens become the norm. You know, when you're walking through a building and you, you, you've forgotten that that fire exit sign was there, and the only time you, you, you make notice of it is when the fire alarm goes off. It's, the, it's those kind of things that make it a latent condition. Or let's say you should have uh, illuminated fire exit points. And uh, maybe the, because of lack of maintenance and lack of servicing, um, that exit point is now not illuminated at a time when the building is full of smoke and it impedes your means of escape. So those resident pathogens um, are, tend to be present for many years. You know, it's, it's developed over a period of time. And there are variations on it, local circumstances, uh, as to how the approach, the attitude towards a particular risk is interpreted and applied. So yeah, fair enough. But there is also those active failures that allow that penetration through the system of defences. And that typically is supervisors and managers uh, not taking risk management as seriously as it should do and making it a routine part of their business activities. So that's why they've said strategic, yeah, top level decisions. So look at the um, Legionella example, whereby uh, the, the incident in Cumbria where the facilities manager was prosecuted as a result of 80 people being affected by Legionella coming through the air conditioning system. She had decided not to use her budget that year um, for Legionella checks. She decided because she was capped and she had to pull some money out of somewhere, um, what she did was stop doing those tests and the, the Legionella built up in the air conditioning system. 
um, that money perhaps was put into a different part of the budget. She used it for something else and like living with cross fingers in all that period. And unfortunately it went wrong. So there, there are times where we say at strategic top level, those decisions were made, um, putting people at risk as such. And therefore from a management point of view, it's changing that leadership style and decision-making process so that safety becomes first. Safety is imperative in the decision-making process. So the conditions we look at there are active failures that tend to be unique to a specific event, yeah, because again, every company has different ways of doing things, but the same conditions can contribute to a number of different accidents. So if you think about our approach to risk management, we tend to think about um, manage the pennies and the, the pounds will look after themselves. So if we report near misses and incidents, and we, we analyze that from a trend perspective, there's less chance of the accident happening with major impact. So there are those theories that are in, introduced into this area as well. The latent conditions can increase the likelihood of active failures through the creation of local factors promoting errors and violations. Now, errors and violations are typically deliberate in some specs, uh, the violation side of it, and errors are a way of working that have been allowed to take place and usually down to lack of effective supervision because the bad habits have developed. They can also aggravate the consequences of unsafe acts by their effects on systems defenses. Yeah, so what we're saying there is if you think about the arrow going through on the cheese, the hole becomes bigger. Therefore, the target is easier to go through because of the way of working. We just accept things being at a lesser standard. So it comes down to the Swiss cheese model and that trajectory, um, accident trajectory. We'll look at potential for this to happen. The necessary condition for an organizational accident is the rare conjunction. Now, interesting to use that word rare. But obviously, in, in, in some of these disasters, we've learned from the fact that it wasn't that rare. There was perhaps quite a few incidents that were overlooked, that were ignored leading up to the major incident. And you, you do see that from quite a few of the investigations that take place on disasters. It says that, yeah, months before such a thing was reported, but ignored. Um, they had a similar incident in the plant three months ago, whereby they should have known from that and so on and so forth. So there's quite often those trends that have developed. So when we say rare conjunction, is it that rare? Because the signs were telling us uh, over a period of history that things weren't as they should be. So uh, the rare conjunction of a set of holes in the successive defenses, allowing hazards to come into damaging contact with people and assets. Yeah, so that's what we mean by the, the trajectory in the Swiss cheese model. Now, Slightly differently, if we look at this one in the stages in the investigation of an organizational accident, if you look at the top of that picture there, what we're saying is the trajectories there again, you've got the defenses in those four pillars, but you've got the holes lining up so it allows that arrow to go through to create the loss. Yeah. So um, unlike the domino theory, where if you take out one of the dominoes, it stops them from falling over because when one falls over, the others don't affect. So if you can control and remove that, this is different. This says that everything aligned and therefore bang, the loss was created, the disaster happened. So if you look at that pyramid, it's then looking at more factors and particularly the organizational aspect. You know, it's the biggest one at the base and that's where the focus lies. If they get around it right at job role, at uh, activities being analysed at risk assessment level and project managing it in the base of any project, then it doesn't lead to as many circumstances and, and as many factors in the line of it. So if you've done all your investigative routes, perhaps used FMEA as an example of that or other analysis, analysis techniques, then the project team would make sure that at the early stage, particularly in high risk environments, that these factors are considered and then mitigated or managed effectively. Yep, so just one example there of, um, I'll have to put my glasses on for this because it's, it's not a great picture. So the barriers breached and the relationship of barriers to the critical factors. 
Yeah, so some people quite often use this in a pictorial fashion and they'll, they'll say, well, what are these slices of cheese? What are the problem areas? Um, and if we manage those effectively, let's bring those big holes down to small holes. Let's stop that trajectory from going through and resulting in the, the overall impact. So just to summarize, finish off this, hence there's no single cause of an accident. It's usually a combination of multi-factors. Multi yeah. They occur through the unforeseen collection of several distinct factors, each one necessary, but singly insufficient to cause the catastrophic breakdown. Yeah. Therefore, it comes down to mismanagement uh, in some respects, because we've allowed those factors to come together. Okay, so I'm going to um, stop that there. Um, um, because I want to lead on to the next session. Um, I just I, th I thought it's important to give you the overview, first of all, of um, accidents and accident models and the theories behind it to then lead towards reliability, uh, systems critical safety, and also the importance of maintenance to prevent these things from happening. So um, thanks for your time, as usual, and I hope you've learned uh, something from that that could be helpful, perhaps, in your assignments later on.